on Northshire's YouTube channel. Uh, but don't worry, only the people who are unmuted and speaking and highlighted in this nice little yellow box will be the ones showing up on the, on the internet there. Um, and then likewise, if you have any questions for our guests tonight, please type them at any point during the chat. Rachel and I will save them up for you and we'll then take turns posing them when we get to the Q&A uh, at the end of the event. And, and the last thing is just a note of thanks. Um, it's been a hard year for independent bookstores and local independent stores of all kinds and we couldn't have gotten through it without your help. So um, we really appreciate it. All right, um, well, let me hand things over to Rachel. Hi there, everybody. Tonight, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Emma Smith to Northshire Live. She is a professor of Shakespeare Studies at Oxford University and has published widely on Shakespeare and other early dramatists. She's joining us tonight from Oxford to talk about her fascinating book, This is Shakespeare, which was recently released in paperback. Tonight, she'll be interviewed by a longtime friend of the Northshire, Mark Dean Fuller, the executive and artistic director of Saratoga Shakespeare Company. He's an actor, writer, director, and producer with over 25 years experience working in film, television, and stage. We're delighted to have partnered with our great friends at Saratoga Shakespeare to present this evening's event and encourage you to visit saratogashakespeare.org to learn more about their terrific work in our community and sign up for their email list. Please join me in welcoming Emma Smith and Marcus Dean Fuller to Northshire Live. Hi, Emma. Uh, can you can everybody hear me? Okay. Everybody's good. I see a lot of nods. That's good. Okay. Um, so uh, Emma and I were chatting a little bit before all of you joined us, and we were talking a little bit about the, the, the world in general and about her amazing book. And I was saying that as an artist, uh, you know, I, I love reading these, these, these books, uh, especially, you know, anything on Shakespeare and, and as they unpack the work and, and the histronics, et cetera. And I said, with, with this book, this is Shakespeare, um, I was blown away for a lot of reasons, but mostly it wasn't what was being said. It was the fact that it was said and that it was being said in such an accessible way um, that as an artist I didn't just find new information I found a tool a working tool and so as we kind of get into this tonight I hope uh, I hope that you you will also be adding this to your your life toolbox it is it is quite amazing and remarkable um, so before we get into this I want to I want to do a little theatrics here I want to build a world okay I want you to imagine a world full of civil unrest with class division and a world in which plague is ravaging the, the countryside. And I'm not talking about our, our current time. I'm talking about the Elizabethan times in the 17th, 16th and 17th century and enter William Shakespeare. So I'd like to start, if I may, with, with a little quote from the introduction of your book. The introduction you say, the Shakespeare in this book is more questioning and ambiguous, more specific to the historical circumstances of his own time, more unexpectedly relevant to ours. This begins something that you start to build upon and you give it a term, gappiness. Can you explain for us what, what gappiness is and how you came to it? Hi, Marcus. Yeah, thanks. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, it's real so a bittersweet advantage of this scenario, isn't it? That I would never have the chance to talk to you uh, here from Oxford if, if we weren't in this terrible state. So um, uh, make of that what, what you will. Yeah, um, Marcus has been really nice about my book. Um, so it's a book about Shakespeare, uh, which tries not to be as bossy and as know-all as some books about Shakespeare. And it tries, I think, to sort of, um, suggest to its readers that they are already pretty well skilled in how to uh, how to how to get to grips with Shakespeare. It's not it's not something for specialists. It's not something uh, that's too difficult, and that's uh, one of the reasons I think Shakespeare often looks very difficult to us is that we are taught quite early on to think that there is a right answer, that Shakespeare sort of means something, and we aren't maybe quite understanding it. We're not quite getting it. Um, we need uh, help to understand what, 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 his, what his meaning is, and we, we need a kind of translator or something. And once we've got that translator, we've got the answer. And I suppose in my book, I'm trying to say something different, which is uh, that a lot of the ways in which Shakespeare is difficult is not, uh, it, 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 it's not us, it's him. Uh, and he's 
difficult because it's actually sort of trying to keep two or three possibilities open at the same time. So when things are difficult to uh, to follow or to understand, it's usually because they're a bit knotted up or um, maybe may a bit um, insincere or inauthentic. Uh, complicated speeches in Shakespeare are usually characters who are not being truthful to themselves or to us. And, and, and the, the speeches are complicated because of that kind of, uh, that, that, that sort of hide and seek there is um, with them. So, so instead of the, the kind of right answer Shakespeare, I tried to think about a Shakespeare who um, needs us to uh, engage with his works um, and leaves a lot of space for us to do that. And that space I call a kind of gap equality. Uh, and the gappiness in Shakespeare is all the questions, the unresolved things, the ambiguities, the, uh, the, the ways in which it's not clear what happens or what a character should look like or uh, why uh, the things that happen, happen. And those gaps are, I think, the spaces for us. Um, and they've always been spaces for us. It's, that's why I think Shakespeare has lasted and has continued to be so important that instead of being a kind of complete sealed up sort of cultural uh, icon, uh, instead he's been a, his works have been very, very permeable, very porous, very spacious, uh, and generations of thinkers and theater makers and readers like us uh, have, have you know, made their own meanings out of them. That's, that's, their, that's the greatest gift they can give us. So gappiness uh, is the opposite of the right answer. And instead it's saying, uh, Sh Shakespeare's full of holes, and the good thing about the holes is their space for us to get it, get inside, uh, get alongside. Oh, I love that. So, so it's interesting when I when I when I got to the introduction, I was very excited, and I, this idea of gappiness is floating around my head. I open up to the first chapter. You you touch on twenty different uh, plays in, in the course of the book, and the first chapter you chose to to touch on it was Taming of the Shrew, which was. Uh, kind of surprising for me at first and until I started getting into it. Can you explain why you chose Taming of the Shrew? Well, um, I, I chose Taming of the Shrew because it's, um, it's an early play by Shakespeare. And in fact, the chapters in my book quite conventionally are done pretty much in the order we think Shakespeare Beer wrote them. Um, and I chose it because I think it's a really good example of this central theme that we've just been talking about. One of the things I wanted to do for each of the chapters in my book was to give a, just give a sort of synopsis of the play. I, I absolutely know that um, for lots of people, the details of these plays are not uh, on the tip of your tongue. Um, and, and I wanted to sort of give, just give a, a sort of short scenario of what, what, what's, what, what's this play about. And with The Taming of the Shrew, that's actually impossible because you can't give uh, a kind of neutral account of the play and then say, well, or it could be another way around. Everything you say about the play uh, could be, is, is open to, um, is, is open to the al an alternative view. So for example, you could say this is a play um, in which a uh, sort of zany, um, uh, sort of so social, uh, pair of social outcasts um, get together and they are shocking to the sort of bourgeois uh, couples and families around them, but they found each other and they're going to have a very unconventional but actually very mutual uh, kind of relationship. Or you could say, um, here is a feisty uh, woman who knows her own mind and that mind is not to get married and her father marries her off without her agreement to a man who is just a bounty hunter. He wants her money and he treats her abominably and breaks her spirit uh, until at the end she is uh, brought out to mouth uh, some sort of patriarchal kind of platitudes. Now they're completely different plays, um, but they're both the Taming of the Shrew and there are lots of other uh, aspects uh, of, of the play, which are different uh, in different sort of interpretations and depending how you look on it. So it seemed to me actually a great place to start because the, the, the gappiness and the ambiguity is absolutely hardwired into that play. It's really, really fundamental um, uh, that the, 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 um, the title 
suggests that the shrew, presumably uh, that the character Catherine has been tamed, but I, you know, my title would have a question mark at the end of it. You know, <laughs> has, ha, has she, it, you know, is she the shrew? Um, Absolutely, you know, and uh, you know, you mentioned it's it's it is one of the early comedies, and co and Shakespeare's comedies tend to be very back and forth, very almost sitcom. They, you know, they rapid fire right along, and yet in the end, she, you know, uh, Kate has this long speech that kind of comes out of nowhere, and, uh, which is ironic because it at first it seems misplaced. She's to your point, she, is she tame? And then she opens up on this very very long speech, and it is a bit antithetical to Petruchio's last few lines as well. Yeah, I mean, Kate, so, so we haven't seen Catherine for ages in the play. Um, uh, that's, quite, that's quite often the case in, in act four in Shakespeare. Um, I don't think he's very good at it. Don't think he knows what to do usually. Um, and if, if you're a theatre maker, you're probably gonna make some of your cuts there because not much seems to be happening. And that's kind of true here too, that, that the play switches away from the main characters and has a bit of side plot that uh, doesn't seem in a way very important. And then back comes Catherine and she speaks a speech which is about 50 lines long, uh, telling the other women uh, in the play and in the audience, in fact, that they, how they should obey their husbands. <laughs> and it's a really, I mean, it's a really striking speech because on the face of it, she's just saying, um, uh, women, uh, women owe loyalty to their husbands. They owe loyalty just as the um, citizen owes loyalty to the monarch and the servant to the master. And you know this is all in a chain of uh, proper relationships. Um, your husband looks after you, so you should look after him. So she goes on and on and on and on. Um, in some ways, this it's for, it goes on for so long that it starts to self destruct. I think. There's only so long as a woman uh, in a sort of patriarchal world where you can stand talking uninterrupted, saying women are just worms, women just should just, you know, their husbands should do everything, their husbands, they should just be quiet and let their husbands speak. You know, uh, she, the fact that she's just standing there going on and on and on starts to ironize the whole, the whole situation. So I think it's a really kind of wonderful case. It's, it's a brilliant example of how actors actually can turn that in some quite different ways and how the body language of Catherine can change very much. Um, I remember seeing um, an actor do, do that speech in different ways. And one of the ways she did it like this. And you just think just having the arms folded was just go on, yeah, you know, just just you dare, yeah, you know. I mean, it's it's a, it's a posture which is full of a kind of contrary to the to the words that are said, and that's obviously a really kind of amazingly wonderful thing about the theatre that it, it it operates in all these different dimensions, and that what the bodies of the actors can be doing on stage and their words are say are saying can be completely at odds, and that's one of the ways in which sort of wonderful meanings and discoveries happen. And Marcus is quite right. At the end of this long speech, Catherine says, well, I, women should be ready to put their hands under their husband's foot. And that's what I'm ready to do now. There's no stage direction. So we don't know whether she does put her hand under uh, Petruchio's foot. And Petruchio says in the line, which is um, for anybody who likes a musical has become the most uh, sort of celebrated line in this play. Why there's a wench, come on and kiss me, Kate. Again, though, uh, one of the ways in which these gaps happen in Shakespeare is there is no stage direction. Right. So if you want, if you want to say yes, uh, they kiss, or she kisses him, or he kisses her, all of which are quite different, uh, aren't they? Uh, you could, but you could also maintain uh, an ending to the play where he. Um, asks for something and is actually rebuffed or, you know, th that doesn't quite happen or there's a, a standoff or the, you know, the play ends uh, on, a, on, an, on an off note. One of the other characters then speaks the very last lines of the play. And sometimes I've seen that done where, where they're covering over the fact that Catherine and Petruchio are, uh, as, as we would say in, in the UK, snogging enthusiastically. Uh, and they're sort of saying, <clears throat> you know, well, you know, but, but maybe it's time for us to finish now. But I've also seen it done where those, th those final lines are stepping into a very awkward pause 
I'm trying to say something because uh, that this is this is not how it's ended up, and and you know those possibilities are all there, uh, waiting in the script for, you know, for actors and for people like Marcus uh, to to you know to explore in the rehearsal room to bring out bring out in the in. Uh, well, it's in funny. The my, my first the first time I saw this production, um, you know, I, I I had no real strong point of view of it other than having read the play. And uh, the production I saw, I was a student in graduate school at the time, and I saw this wonderful production. It was an all-male production, actually. And um, the, the, the actor playing Kate, the reason that they, the, how the actor justified the length of that speech was that she kept talking over him. So she would give him just enough breath that he would go to say something, and then she would start talking again and talking again until finally he was beaten into submission verbally. And he went to say, finally, you know, kiss me. He never got the words out. She grabbed him and literally threw him up against the wall and just planted this smothering kiss on him. So uh, it was, it became this kind of illusion of, uh, you know, masculine power and, mm -hmm. and possessiveness. And so they, they flipped it around really easy. And I think that that lends to your point of gappiness, you know, especially when, when we look at it through this sense of kind of uh, gender and power, um, and it's interesting, what, uh, you know, that leads to my next one. I want to talk a little about Twelfth Night, um, because those, Taming of the Shrew and Twelfth Night in this book were really interesting to me. You, uh, Twelfth Night, you, you, you chose Twelfth Night to focus on the character of Antonio mm. and his relationship specifically with Sebastian, which I found yeah. very interesting because I hadn't given it that much thought before. Mm. And then the minute you unpacked it for me, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to see it differently again. Mm. Can you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that's um, that's that's really yeah, that's really interesting. So, but why I wanted to talk about this minor character in Twelfth Night. So, um, uh, Antonio is uh, a, a, a kind of sailor or or some kind of figure who rescues the twin of the central character Viola. He's called Sebastian, and kind of ha hangs around with him a bit. Um, but he is, he seems quite a pointless character. And I'm always quite interested in things which seem sort of unnecessary. And I'm particularly interested in, in it because um, one of the things we know about Shakespeare is that he writes for uh, the theatre company uh, in which he's a shareholder. So he's got a real, literally a real investment in his, in his company. He also, unlike all the other playwrights of the time, he's got an absolutely fixed uh, market, if you like, for his own plays. He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to go around auditioning or sort of pitching to different companies as, you know, Ben Johnson or Christopher Marlowe or somebody would do. He's got, he, he knows, he knows who's going to perform in his plays and he knows, uh, you know, how they're going to be performed and the theatre they're going to be performed in. And he's writing them all uh, very much with a, with a, a, a cast and a, 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 a sort of scenario in mind. And one of the ways in which he writes them with that in mind is with great economy for the number of actors that are needed. So uh, we think that most Shakespeare plays have about 30 named characters. They can usually be acted by 12 uh, adult actors and sometimes two and two, sometimes three um, younger sort of late adolescent actors who play women's roles. So they're very tightly organized and uh, uh, the, often actors will play more than one role, but that's very cleverly written so that there's time for them uh, to, to be change their costume, uh, which is no, um, no small time actually when there are no, um, you know, Velcro or uh, um, zips or any of those easy fastenings, you know, fastening you, fastening you into, a, into a costume would be like sort of lacing you into a, um, a kind of bodice or something. It's a really kind of quite, 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 takes quite a long time. So they're carefully done, that's to say, to, to, to maximize um, the use of a small, relatively small number of actors. So that means that if you've got a character who doesn't seem to be really worth it in terms of the plot, that's, that, there's a kind of oddity there. And particularly when one of the things I love about comedies and how they work for Shakespeare is that they have a big busy scene at the end when everybody, everybody comes on stage. And that's um, the way that all the sort of misunderstandings get ironed out and we see people again, but it's also an affirmation that uh, 
comedies have an, the sense that the, the world is, a, is, is big and that we are at our best when we are together. Um, we get on each other's nerves and we sometimes misunderstand each other, but really we are sociable and, and social animals and that, that's what comedy understands. I mean, tragedy, I think, thinks we are isolated monsters and that's, that's, that's how, we're, how we're headed. So um, at the end of Twelfth Night, um, this character, Antonio, is, is there. Uh, so that means uh, he can't be any of the other characters. The actor can't play any of the other characters who might also be there. So all these things are adding up to a sense, this is quite an expensive use of an actor. So that made me look a bit more closely at why, why he might be there. And to, to sort of, I, I've, I've spent a long time on the structure of the, of the, of the theater and the, the payoff in the play might seem a bit small for that. But I think that what is important about Antonio is he represents um, a kind of selfless uh, desire uh, he's in he's in love with Sebastian whatever you think that means whatever you want that to mean uh, you could argue that this is the the strong kinds of male friendship that were entirely understood in the Renaissance and entirely compatible with uh, uh, with 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 men being married uh, married to women or you could say that they are gay in 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 a kind of proto modern modern way but what's more important than that is that antonio is absolutely selfless he is willing to put himself in danger for the thing that he loves and that is something that really almost nobody else in the play for all their um music be the food of love and all of that uh they're all pretty self obsessed uh they're a kind of it's a narcissistic uh, world, I think, Twelfth Night, and, and very beautiful for that. I mean, narcissists are very often very, very beautiful and, and very sort of compelling. Um, but Antonio brings something, um, something different. Um, and that felt, that, that felt an important kind of sideways, sideways in to the play. I think one of the ways I deal myself with the fact that these plays have got all this um, huge weight of uh, clever and scholarly critical opinion, you know, it's, it, it, it's really hard to think how, how would you do something different with these plays than has been done by much cleverer and much more erudite people than me in the past. And one of the ways I think is sort of creeping up on them a bit from the side or, you know, sort of trying to catch the, ca catch the play unawares and sort of tip it onto its back um, as if it's a kind of porcupine or something. <laughs> Um, and, and I think doing the Antonio, that's a bit of a kind of sideways kind of creep up. Uh, so the play doesn't quite know that you're there and then you can, you, you can, you can sort of startle it to reveal something that it might, might not have been there. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, in, uh, let's talk about Elizabethan's uh, view of love, uh, especially male, male love. Um, you know, it's different than it is today. Today, to your point, we, we use a lot of labels. We have, you know, a lot of ways to kind of uh, dictate that. But, but in an Elizabethan purview, I mean, the, the idea of male-male love would have been very different. I mean, there, you're, it's, it's, it, you, you were kind of in a position where you had to marry a woman, but they, they weren't necessarily going to be your soulmate. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, um, uh, and that's, uh, so, so this is a culture which places a very high value on male, uh, male friendships and suggests that really it is only with other men uh, or another man who is your sort of soulmate that you can be yourself and that your wife um, may be, um, you know, pleasant enough and um, domestic enough and you would have your children and continue your line, but your wife was very unlikely to have had the same education as you was very unlikely to have had the same experience of the world as you. You were perhaps, perhaps it was more limited the amount, the number of things that you could you could talk about. Um, you know the number of, um, uh, you know scholarly and educated men in this period. We know we know who were married to women who don't seem to have been able to write, suggests a kind of a disparity between the experience. Which you know it, it, we we all know couples who 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 are. Uh, absolutely devoted despite all, you know those those kinds of differences but I think generally culturally um, it, it was understood that in particular men would have their strongest emotional relationships with other men so in this case too would you would you say would you agree that uh, the theater becomes a teacher in Elizabethan 
in, uh, part of the education of the Elizabethan uh, youth? Yeah, I think I think it I think it does. Um, it's particularly it's interesting these these rom coms that we we still have the genre. We now associate it almost entirely with women, young women, and how how they should behave. But really, this was a genre which was developed to teach young men how to behave. And in Shakespeare's hands, it's usually about the fact that uh, in order to get married, um, the message is men have to give up their primary attachment to other men. And that that's uh, one of the things I do in the book is I, um, uh, I, I try and think about uh, I try and think about modern examples and some of these work for some people and don't don't for other people and some have been very annoying to some readers but on this point I talk about the um the sitcom Friends and I talk about uh the last very last episode of that long running uh series which is about the um uh the guys uh, moving out of their apartment and breaking up the table for squall which has been the sort of sign of of their sort of bachelor life mm. And you know they're all moving on, and that's a good thing, and they need to do that. But it's also really sad, and I think that's very, very Shakespearean. It's a very Shakespearean comedy kind of moment that um, uh, men uh, find themselves losing something. Particularly men. The focus is on men, uh, although in some cases women too. But largely men find themselves really losing something when they uh, w w when they get hooked up with women. So do you and, think and the plays seem to be? So Sorry. Go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say the play seemed to say, yeah, suck it up. That's that's what it's that that's what you need to do. Yeah. So I guess that that answers my question in some ways. So is Shakespeare? Do you believe Shakespeare in this point is being subversive, or has this become an anthem for the the youth of that time? Is he saying, you know, this is totally normal. You should, you know, this is the, this is what it is, or is he saying no? Because it is a comedy, like any other, and the comedies drive toward marriage. So. Mm -hmm. Is he, you know, or is he being subversive under all that saying, look, what you're feeling is normal. This is normal. This is, you know, or it's yeah. a, this happens like. It's a really great question. I think people went to the theater in Shakespeare's time to be taken away from their everyday world. These are not primarily realistic or do, they're certainly not documentary plays. They're not realistic plays. Uh, they're not, uh, as we would say about sort of, uh, 20th century British drama. They're not kitchen sink dramas. Um, uh, uh, they are much more fairy tale and much more escapist and much more things can happen in the theatre. You know, what happens in the theatre stays in the theatre. You know, things can happen in the theatre that can't happen in real life. Um, and I guess Twelfth Night is really interesting on that. So if we're saying about men, um, these strong relationships between men have to be broken uh, in order for men to get married. Twelfth Night really turns that, uh, not just in the in, in with Antonio, but in fact with the central, uh, one of the central couples, Orsino and Viola. So Orsino has fallen in love with uh, a young man who is actually Viola uh, in male costume. And he has developed this male-male friendship, which is all about confiding in him and, um, uh, uh, going out riding and doing sort of manly things together but uh, uh, and at the end you know it's really it, it, it uh, Orsino realizes that Vi that Cesario is really a woman and and it, it's an absolute bingo he's got both yeah. he does not have to choose between his best male friend and his wife because this ambiguous um, uh, sort of male female um, figure in, in Twelfth Night can be both when I uh, when I was in graduate school, I played Orsino. I got cast in that role, and mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly how I played it. I, I, yeah. And the big reveal came. Uh, I almost went and kissed him, and I stopped. Or you know, I I heard you know, and I I stopped mm -hmm. it because he he turns real quick. He turns and he's like, oh, but I've always loved you, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that was exactly it. You know, you get you get your both, and so yeah. you know, when yeah. you know, it just fits. He's I mean, he's the epitome of narcissism in that way, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. So you know. The, when we talk about theater as education too, and Elizabethan education, the, the, the young Elizabethans, you know, they, they went to school and uh, and they primarily, they, they learned rhetoric, didn't they? I mean, that was kind of really what they were taught. Yes. And so with, with Shakespeare, you know, he would have learned this. And then, and yet he goes back to what is in essence at the time, a didactic theater. And he starts creating this new form, so to speak, mm. this form of question, mm. not inquiry. And, 
Yes, I think um, what Shakespeare, like other Elizabethan schoolboys, learnt um, was a, uh, an education, as you say, which was really uh, focused on rhetoric and, and oratory and on sort of rewriting stories, existing stories, classical stories, from one form into another or from one perspective into another. So there's a really common classroom exercise that Shakespeare and his contemporaries would have done, which was about, you know, writing a speech by someone who is not, who isn't given a speech sort of um, at the fall of Troy or, uh, you know, at this point in a kind of classical story. Um, and I think it produced two particular professions in profusion. One was uh, the theatre, the other was uh, lawyers, I think. Uh, it's a kind of it, it's quite a kind of loyally um, uh, a training as well, but it but it leads uh, very directly, I think, in, into the into the theatre, and I think it leads into this um, kind of gappy quality that I've talked about. One one um, important thing about classroom rhetoric was it it was not at all important what you believed to be true. So it wasn't saying, you know, persuade me that your view is right. It was saying, um, make the case for both sides and make it as compelling as you can. So, you know, make this person's view of this story as real and as compelling as their enemy's view of it. That's, that's, that's the job of the, that's what rhetoric is supposed to do. And I think that's what the plays do. And that means it's actually very difficult sometimes to judge what, where Shakespeare wants our sympathies to lie, you know, in a in, in a play like Julius Caesar, where Caesar is assassinated, um, uh, it's really hard to know. You know, you could look at it that Caesar uh, was a was a threat to the Republic, and that Brutus and Cassius are honourable men, as we hear later. Or you could see that Caesar is a um, uh, is 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 a is 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 a decent um, leader who is you know who is who is just murdered. Um, so one of the uh, things, one of the things you talk about, and it, you know, bring up Julius Caesar, is this this sense of like power and and the the theater of politics. You talk about power, and when you when you mention Richard II as well, and it's interesting because um, this idea of good leadership, bad leadership, of of creating a balanced argument, uh, a balanced character. So to speak. So Richard II is, is grossly unbalanced, and we can see that kind of moving right into it. And um, but he's a better actor than Bolingbroke. Can you talk about that a little bit about the balance of the the power between those two? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, I think Richard II does absolutely dramatize the uh, the discrepancy between theatrical power and political power. So, so Richard is absolutely dominant in his play. We could, we could put it another way. R Richard II um, thinks he is in a tragedy <laughs> and he's in a tragedy which is named after him. And so he is the main character and he has to have a lot of big poetic speeches because that's what it is to be in a tragedy. Henry Bolingbroke thinks he is in a history there isn't a lot of time for talking in history. You've got to strap your armor on and, and, and hack your way through the battlefield and get power that way. Now, that makes Bolingbroke um, not, not a very compelling character on the stage. He doesn't tell us anything about himself. He doesn't confide in us. Um, we don't really know why he does what he does, but it makes him a very you know, ruthlessly effective um, kind of political figure. Richard is, is the complete opposite. He is, he is all, you know, he's, he's absolutely, um, you know, sort of melting all over the stage. We, we, we see we're with him. He has an extraordinary emotional and poetic range. Uh, he's, he's absolutely center, center stage. Uh, and while he's doing that, somebody is marching into the throne room and taking the crown. Well, it's interesting. Something I'm similar is happening, in fact, in Hamlet when they're all talking, talk, 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 Fortinbras is just marching, stamp, right. stamp, stamp. Yeah, and then they're all dead and in he comes and says, oh. I'll take it. like you need me. Mm. <laughs> right. That's right, that's right. And I, I love this idea of balance. And um, I'm kind of, I'm, I, I've been chewing on it since I read those chapters that Richard II is being this kind of unbalanced 
character, uh, but he's a better actor. And then Bolingbroke comes in and he is not very good politically, theatrically. Um, and we, you know, he is what he is as a leader. To your point, there's a purity of purpose about who he is as a character. Um, but we don't get a sense of balance. And so the play leaves us very dry, very cold. We know that the right, you know, the, the bad leader is gone. The new leader is in. That was correct. However, we're all kind of left a little what happens now. And you, you do go into Henry IV part one a bit in, in the book. Um, and it was interesting because Falstaff, the introduction of Falstaff, I think is, is just seems so much bigger to me in so many ways now that you've introduced this idea of balance. Because, uh, and although you left, I know you didn't touch on Henry IV part two and Henry V, but Falstaff seems to be the outlier to me in that argument where we see Henry V kind of getting tutored in the theatrics by Falstaff, this character that is introduced early on. And in essence, it makes him a more balanced king when he finally ascends to the throne. So do you, in some ways, do you feel like all of those are about, to your point, balance and the balance and theatrics of power and kind of the marriage of those, those things? And again, as Shakespeare, is, is that Shakespeare being subversive? during that time or or is he or is yeah. it a warning? I think you're right that there is um I mean what one argument is that yeah that that Henry V is is Shakespeare's um kind of hero king who is able to combine the uh rhetorical effectiveness of Richard II and the political pragmatism of Henry Bolingbroke. And so he, he is kind of unbeatable and that's why he's able to have this famous victory uh, over, the, over the French. Um, yeah, and I, 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 can, I think that's a great idea um, that, that uh, it's Falstaff who brings that, brings those two things, yeah, brings those two things together. I think it's an interesting question whether Shakespeare's histories are, um, subversive or, or or conventional. We we used to always be taught that they were conventional and that they were in the service of the Tudor monarchy. Um, but certainly they're written at a time when um, any uh, discussion of even the, the even these ideas that we've been talking about what makes the good what makes the good leader. I mean that's uh, if you have um, a, a, an inherited monarchy. Uh, the question of what makes a good leader is itself a very, very subversive question because you, you're not getting a good leader. You're just getting the son of the leader you had before. Uh, that, and if they happen to be good, great, but it, it's, not, it's not really for debate. This is not, the, you know, these are not elections. Um, How far uh, so, yeah, along the line do we need to get before we forget the Rex and Tyrannus, right? It's like, well, this was by God and now this person took it. Well, yeah, but they're the king now. So <laughs> that's kind of the way it is. And to your point, that's who it, we have now. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, know. we still have this, that in the UK, you know, saying, <laughs> will Charles make a good king? You think, well, actually, you know, if, if, that were the, if that were the criterion, we'd do it all quite differently, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. Charles will be king. That's, you know, that, that's well, it. it. It's interesting. So, and in, in to this point, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare followed up Henry V, where I, I, I do feel like he finds this balance with this character to some degree. And he follows it up with Julius Caesar, which is, which is um, amazing, because suddenly he's, he's kind of turning it all over again. And your chapter on Caesar in the book, again, I want to get back to the book a little bit. You focus on a very small character, uh, Sin of the Poet. Can you explain why? Well, again, I was sort of thinking about um, uh, sort of creeping, creeping up on the play. And I was thinking about why, um, what happens when a, when a poet or a writer writes a little cameo about a writer? What, what does that mean? That seems to be sort of weighted in ways that it wouldn't be if they wrote a little cameo about um, a kind of, you know, a butcher or a shoemaker or something. Um, so what happens in Julius Caesar is after the um, after the assassination of Caesar, and the the crowd have been turned by Mark Antony's brilliant rhetoric. You know the speech which begins um, friends, Romans, and 
uh, countrymen. They've been turned to think that actually what Brutus and the others have done has been has, has been a terrible act of violence. Um, and uh, a crowd leaving um, to turn on this innocent bystander who happens to share the name of one of the conspirators who's called Sinna. And this is somebody called, who's called Sinna the poet. And he keeps saying, I'm not that Sinner. And they say, you, you know, you, well, we'll we, we're just going to we're just going to get you anyway. And they taunt him. And uh, it, it's not completely clear, but it, I think in most readings of the play would say they're pretty much tear, tear him to pieces. You know, they, they, they beat him to death. This is a kind of act of mob violence. And it's it's hard to read in the context of the play. It's hard to know whether we're supposed to think this is a sign that everything, you know, law and order has completely gone now. Uh, the death of Caesar has unleashed this terrible um, decline in 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 sort of behavior in, in society, or whether it's a kind of echo of the death of Caesar, but instead of being of a really important person that we've all heard of, and and it's of this very minor person who we've never heard of, and who is a sort of in a way kind of a joke figure, but but a joke figure that has something terrible happen happen to them. So I tried to use that to think again about the sort of sympathies in the play um, and uh, and also about something which I think is very modern about Julius Caesar, which is the consciousness that lots of the characters have that, well, they there's a kind of weird way in which they already know they're in a famous story. So they know they're in it in real time and that in the future people will talk about it, but they also know they also are already in that future when people know about, about it. So um, they're a bit like, um, I feel as if, 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 you, if I were putting it on now, they would all, they would take selfies with Caesar's body. That's what we would see. Yeah. Um, so they're already, it's already in, in the eye of history. It's already there. It's already being recorded. Um, and, and that seems, that, that's, that's something I feel very fascinated by about, about that play. And Shakespeare doesn't doesn't let let him off easy either. Once he's once he is murdered, he introduces another character called it's just like another poet. I think. Right? Yeah, there's it? another poet. Then I mean, there's something gone very, very, very wrong somehow at the end of the play that that things things multiply in some odd ways. I I, I enjoy it when Shakespeare's sometimes it's like feeling Shakespeare's play world sort of run away from him a bit. Um, I think when Hamlet goes off. Uh, to England and with and meets the pirates and stuff. You just think, oh no, you oh, know, we've lost the plot. <laughs> we've really lost it here, haven't we? You know, if Act you were four. in play playwriting one hundred and one, you'd say, I think, I don't think really at this point in the play we need the pirates as well. Do you really? You know, we've had, um, and I think something like that happens a little bit. It, you know, the play doesn't just as there's a there's a gap in the world when Caesar is dead who, nobody knows what to do there's a slight feeling the play doesn't quite know where to go either um it's it's experimented by having its main tragic death in the middle and that's very powerful and very interesting but then it means it's a little bit difficult to know what you do after that how do you make a shape out of well, that it's interesting in some ways I've always felt that 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 portion of it, the, the play, the momentum of the play, the psychology of the play uh, takes on the momentum of the mob. It takes on its own mob momentum where it's it's focused at first and it kind of achieves what it needs to achieve. And then it just starts running rampant and getting bigger. And then, you know, it's it, there's all these casualties kind of falling around it. Um, yeah. And I, I was always hopeful that maybe that was purposeful in, in some of it. Yeah, I think, I well, you know, I think, yeah, it, it may it may or not, may not be, purposeful but it's certainly meaningful i think i think that's the distinction i would make i don't mind whether it's purposeful it just it just matters whether it's meaningful so you know and with mobs like uh, uh, one of the other plays you talk about is coriolanus coriolanus um is one of i i believe it to be one of the most difficult plays that that shakespeare wrote i i had the the privilege of playing that the title character um years ago uh and i had already done my hamlet so I thought I was ready for Coriolanus, uh, and I found it to be infinitely, in some ways, more challenging. Um, and I never believed that Shakespeare necessarily uh, wrote psychology, but he write, his writing is deeply psychological. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I found it really in in Coriolanus. And you know, you have a play. A lot of a lot of my students um, in in class will say, "Oh, Coriolanus, I've never read it, never heard about it." They read it, they don't get it. They talk about the irrelevance of Shakespeare, and they say, "Okay, let's look at it again." The play begins with civil unrest. We've got, I mean, it, it begins at the end of a war. We have Coriolanus who instantly says, "Oh, he's brand, you know." please forgive this, this man who helped me. He was a poor man, all these things. And then he instantly can't remember his name. And so this poor man is going to be trucked off and killed. Uh, and then there is a mob in the streets who is, is rioting for food. Uh, it smacks to our own damage in so many ways. And it, it also talks to the theater of politics in a lot of ways. Coriolanus is an utter failure in some ways, theatrically. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, you know, when we talk about class divide in politics, you, you know, and, and at this point in, in Shakespeare's writing, do you think he's writing, would you, would you say he was writing for, uh, again, kind of a social agenda or is he writing, because his writing also changes in that, in, specifically in that play, that his verse starts to really start to change in a whole different sort of way. Is he writing for actors whom have grown with him and who have turned over in some degree within his company? I think I think he probably is writing for actors. I think he's writing for the mature uh, Richard Burbage, who, like you, has done has done Hamlet and and is is sort of moving moving towards uh, not that you are necessarily, but is moving towards Prospero. Uh, so Coriolanus is is sort of in in there. I think I think there is an interesting aspect about Coriolanus in its own moment, where I think uh, so Shakespeare's company spend. Um, most of their, um, most of Shakespeare's career, they, they spend uh, performing in outdoor, so-called outdoor playhouses like Shakespeare's Globe on London's Bankside, which uh, the, the rebuilt Globe, if you ever have visited London or seen it, seen it online. Um, and then around 1608, which is about the date of Coriolanus, they uh, get the lease on an indoor theatre called Blackfriars. And Blackfriars is a, effectively, it's a boutique theatre. It's much smaller and much more expensive and much higher status to go to than the Globe. And it does seem interesting to me that he writes a play which is all about a man saying, I'm not going to show myself off before the masses. I'm not going to give them exactly what they want. I'm not going to act. Um, you know, and show my wounds. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Um, uh, I, I'm not, you know, I'm sort of better than that. And that there is a sort of theatrical element to that. I mean, in some ways, what Coriolanus doesn't want to be is in the globe. Right. <laughs> I mean, and I think one of the reasons he's such a difficult character is he doesn't want to be an actor. You know, he, do, he doesn't want to do the things that uh, we're back to what we were talking about about the English history plays that 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 are the same for actors and for politicians, which is about being visible to an audience, and that's that's exactly the thing he won't do, and that's you know that's pretty rebarbative in a, in a theatrical character because that's what we want them to do. That's great. I know we're running a little little short on time. I had. Um one more play that I was so hoping was going to be in the book. And I'm, I would love to just pick your brain on it a little bit. Um, because you, pick, again, you picked 20, 20 plays to kind of touch on. Um, I'd like to know why you picked those plays. And the one play I would love to just hear you talk about a little bit is Titus Andronicus, which I feel oh. such a play, a timely play, and a play really that centers about otherness oh. in so many different ways. And I'd love to just hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, um, in fact, funnily enough, um, uh, there was um, uh, a big big Shakespeare course uh, in Arizona, which was adopting, uh, um, in the University of Arizona, was adopting my book. And they wrote to me and said, will you write a Titus Andronicus chapter? And I said, yeah, fine, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, yeah, I think it's an extraordinary, um, uh, cruel play uh, about our... Distur- terribly disturbing capacity uh, for uh, for violence and for and, and for bystanding. Um, so I think it's and I think it's a great challenge to ideas of tragedy. I think it makes us look at Shakespeare's tragedies a bit a bit differently as well. Um, 
because um, it does bring out the kind of uh, really un, unhealthy aspect there is to uh, tragedies which focus on the terrible sort of trauma of su the suffering, you know, the, 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 those who suffer in tragedy. You know, what kind of entertainment is that? You know, what, what, what kind of people are we? And I think, I think it sort of put, holds a, a mirror up, um, not, not to nature as Hamlet would say, or perhaps to nature exactly, but it's, and it's a rather unflattering one. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is probably the play I most regret leaving out. And I'm so relieved that you didn't say, as you like it, because then I always have to say, I really don't like it, <laughs> so, not very much, thank you. Um, and then I think that offends people who, 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 who love it. Oh, that's great. Well, listen, I know, I know we're short on time. I would love to end again with a little quote from your, from your epilogue, uh, which I also love very much. Um, so if I may. The epilogue is a place in Shakespeare's plays where the vitality, where the vitally cons constitutive role of the audience is explicitly acknowledged. Without them, without us, the play is incomplete. So, this is Shakespeare. Permissive, modern, challenging, gappy, frustrating, moving, attenuated, beautiful, ambiguous, resourceful, provoking, necessary, yours. Emma Smith, this was a beautiful novel. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I've loved talking to you about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a few great audience questions. We are low on time, but I'd love to get to at least a couple of them. Um, the first one is from Brenny um, saying, the playwright David Henry Huang, writing after 9-11, said, the function of art is to make ambiguity tolerable. What advice do you give to teachers, say, to keep the gaps enticing? And not irritating or confusing. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great that's a great question, and I think it's a it's a tough ask when when you're working with working in a context where you're just trying to get one meaning across, never mind two or three. And I recognise that that's a, that's a really tough ask. I think sometimes um, this is where you know performance is is a kind of fantastic resource. Um, uh, YouTube YouTube performances, which very often will give you know can give you some quite different takes uh, on a speech or on a scene that that can sort of bring that a bit more to life uh, for for students. I think trying to get um, a bit of an argument going, perhaps sometimes in the class about why people behave uh, as they do. I find that sometimes uh, sometimes works with with older students. Um, but yeah, and it's a wonderful quotation. Thanks, Brenny. Thanks for th thanks for bringing that that forward. There's, uh, I think we only have time for maybe one more question, and there's a great one here uh, from Emma. She says, "We're so used to modern characters making active choices and having agency, like Fortinbras, and yet one of Hamlet's signature characteristics is indecision. But he's still compelling. Does that speak to those gaps? I'd love to hear you talk about it." <laughs> Yeah, Emma, that's a, that's a really um, that's that's a great observation that we mo modern characters do things, um, and that makes uh, Hamlet's uh, apparent refusal to do anything uh, a, a kind of challenge. I think um, understanding Hamlet's uh, in some ways, Hamlet is the character who, where ambiguity and and a sort of uh, an openness of different interpretations has has long been uh, clear, clearly uh, understood. It's a great place for where where performance can imagine uh, the world of Hamlet in some quite different ways and quite distinctive ways. So I think I think the gaps are are there. The questions about why. Um, why Hamlet behaves uh, as as he does. Um, or, or, or fails to do, um, f fails, fails to act, as you suggest. In the book, I talk about why it is, this is another, perhaps another sideways thing, but it does speak to a point about agency. I talk to what, I talk to the, to the question of why he has the same name as his father. Now, for you in America, that doesn't seem so strange. I, I get that. Uh, for us in the UK, it seems very, really does seem very strange that you don't tend to name a person directly. We don't have the, the sort of Hamlet Jr. Um, but, but I was thinking about Hamlet Jr. and what it's like to be a Hamlet Jr. 
which is to say it is about being overshadowed and, and perhaps uh, haunted um, by the, the, the person who's just Hamlet, uh, which is his father. Um, uh, and that was one of the ways I tried to think about the sort of psychology, uh, the psychology there. So it's a great, it's a great question. Thank you. So unfortunately, we are out of time for this evening. I could have listened to the two of you talk all night long, but Emma, I know it's very late for you in the UK. Um, audience, thank you so much for being here. Emma Smith and Marcus Dean Fuller, thank you so much for your time and this delightful conversation. I have enjoyed this tremendously and watching the comments in the chat, I gather that our audience really has as well. Um, you can order This is Shakespeare at Northshire.com. The link has been in the chat. Um, and thank you all so much. Have a lovely, lovely rest of your evening. Thank Bye. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.